Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Jason Zeller, and I'm the Director of Culinary Operations and Special Events here at Crystal Bridges. We are honored to have Tony Tipton Martin here tonight as part of this year's Distinguished Speaker Series, a series in which we host internationally acclaimed artists and innovators who inspire new ways of thinking about art, architecture, nature, and our community. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this opportunity to hear from such an acclaimed author and activist in the culinary field. And as a special addition to the evening, I'm thrilled to welcome Executive Director of Bentonville's own Brightwater, Dr. Glenn Mack, to introduce Tony on stage. Before we begin the introductions, just a few quick housekeeping notes. I'd like to request that you take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Following the lecture, there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A session with Tony. The program will also conclude with a book signing here at the front of her award-winning book, The Jemima Code, Two Centuries of African-American Cookbooks. If you've not had your chance uh, to grab your copy, you can purchase in the back of the room just after the lecture. Also, I'd like to take a moment and express a big thanks to those who make these series possible, from our colleagues in public programs, especially Sarah Siegerlin and Moira Anderson, our dedicated volunteers for helping us make education programs possible, and as always, our devoted members who continue to support all of our programs at Crystal Bridges. Thank you. I'd also like to extend a deep gratitude to our sponsors for the Distinguished Lecture Series, Del Monte Foods. We're so grateful for your support. Here at Crystal Bridges, I truly believe that our success is attributed to the strong communities in which we form locally and regionally. For me, our ever-growing partnerships with advocates for authentic experiences and culinary excellence, such as Dr. Glenn Mack and Brightwater School, are true examples of innovation and positive impact on the Northwest Arkansas region. As a longtime supporter of many of the programs here at the museum, both culinary and otherwise, Glenn has been a vital part of the fabric of the Bentonville community for many years. Tonight is truly an amazing moment at Crystal Bridges to continue the discussion of how culinary professionals, such as Tony Tipton Martin, can transform communities. And so I could think of no better representative than Glenn Mack to introduce our speaker this evening. An Arkansas native, Dr. Glenn R. Mack currently serves as Executive Director at Brightwater, a center for the, for the study of food at Northwest Arkansas Community College in Bentonville, Arkansas. With extensive international experience in journalism and culinary arts, he worked and studied in the former Soviet Union, China, and Europe. He currently serves on the board for the International Association of Culinary Professionals, the Arkansas Association of Career and Technical Education, and the Culinary Trust. His lifelong passion for noodles, student engagement, smoked fish, and organizational development fill his time. He's also classically trained in the culinary arts in China, Italy, Russia, Uzbekistan, and the US. Glenn, it's a pleasure having you here tonight. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you, Jason. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Wow, what a treat to introduce Tony tonight. She's a friend, a personal inspiration, and also a member of the Food Studies Council for Brightwater. So Tony and I have known each other for a couple of decades. We met in Austin, Texas, and mutual friends said, hey, you're culinary misfits. Why don't you go hang out together? Uh, I had recently left journalism, and Tony was at that point contemplating something big. And I remember sitting in the coffee shop, and she says, I, I, I've got this calling. I'm really drawn to identity and culture. What do you think? And I said, Tony, oh, that's amazing. You got to do it. Now, no, I'm not taking credit for all her subsequent success. But um, it, is, it is truly special to watch somebody's dreams unfold uh, in front of your eyes. And um, uh, I'm just terribly moved to, to have her tonight uh, address. She spoke last night as well at DISH. Um, you know, academia uh, two decades ago was in this um, 
debate about uh, food studies. It's, that's scholarship light. That's nonsense. Uh, chefs didn't know what to do with us. Uh, the scholars didn't know what to do with us. Journalists didn't know what to do with us. But we followed our own path and our own heart. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled to um, uh, present Tony tonight to share a little bit of her story and um, her projects. So please help me welcome um, Tony Chipton Martin, a culinary journal. <laughs> <laughs> you can see she has been quite busy for the past uh, couple of decades. She's a culinary journalist, author, and community activist who has dedicated her career to building healthier communities. She's the author of The Jemima Code, The Two Centuries of African American Cookbooks, a book that celebrates the important legacy of African American cooks and their cookbooks. For this work, Tony received the 2016 James Beard uh, Book Award. For her work, she's the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2016 Art of Eating Prize, the 2015 Certificate of Outstanding Contribution to Publishing from the Black Caucus of the Library Association. Tony is in profiled in the 35th annual 2016 Aetna African American History Calendar, is a member of the James Beard uh, awards committee and co-founder of Southern Foodways Alliance and Foodways Texas. Tony's been a featured speaker at many institutions and book festivals around the country, including the Smithsonian Food Festival, the Mu Museum of African Diaspora, the Longone Center of American Culinary Research at the University of Michigan, Culinary Historians of Southern California, the International Association of Culinary Professionals, and many others. Tony was invited twice uh, by Michelle uh, Obama, the first lady, to the White House, uh, and the first African-American food editor of a major daily newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer. The nutrition writer for the Los Angeles Times and the contributing editor to Heart and Soul magazine. She founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization that promotes the connection between cultural heritage, food, and health through two events. The Children's Picnic, a real food fair, and Soul Summit, a conversation about race, identity, power, and food. She's an advisor to a grassroots peace movement that is rekindling the pie social as a vehicle for racial tolerance and a member of the advisory board of the Old Ways African Heritage Diet Pyramid. Tony's a wife and the mother of four. She splits her time between Texas and Colorado. We are privileged to have Tony here this evening. Now, please join me in welcoming Tony Tipton Martin. That made me sound like quite the overachiever. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Glenn and Jason and Moira, for this invitation. Um, this is really quite a special moment for me um, because, as you heard from Glenn, this book was published in um, 2015, and tonight represents my last stop on a three-year tour. It isn't just um, important that I'm here because it's the end of a wonderful opportunity to introduce so many people to those that I'll be sharing with you tonight and through the book, but it's also because we happen to be in an art museum. And this didn't occur to me, it's not scripted, so I hope I'll stay on task. Um, but I just visited the O'Keeffe exhibition and what occurred to me is that I have spent all of these years in the shadows of African American women in the food world working diligently to be legitimized, to legitimize this work, to legitimize our relationship to food, and to ensure that we were taken seriously and respected. And here I am now in an artistic space where I can also now 
appreciate their artistic value and the value of representing them in the way that we did in the Jemima Code. So it's just, it's a really wonderful place for me to be today, and I thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I want to thank you, the audience, as well, for being here. Um, the Jemima Code is a, one of those challenging labels that I think it takes some, some courage for you to come in and be part of a group, to be part of a conversation um, with such a stigmatized name. So I want you to take a round of applause for yourselves for coming. Because we are going to answer the question, what we can learn from Aunt Jemima uh, and African American cooks besides their recipes for great pancakes. So uh, I want you to take a few minutes. There won't be a quiz after. But I'd like for you to um, recognize that you're having a reaction to this image. Every one of us is feeling something different. Um, for some of us, this is someone who we might have grown up with. We have great affection for her. We know that she took good care of us and she fed us really delicious food. She nourished us at the table. She salved our wounds with food. And she was just generous of spirit. For others, She's an image that needs to be forgotten. This is a stereotype. It is a painful, hurtful remembrance of some not so pleasant times in this country. And the image reflects minimal opportunities for African American women who were forbidden to hold other jobs. It, rec it, it re reminds us of enslavement. It reminds us of, us, us of a very difficult time. And then there's another group of us who don't know what I am talking about. I'm looking around to see how many are here, and today, not that many. But in some uh, spaces where I speak with students in particular, they don't have an, any idea who Aunt Jemima is. They see faces on packages all of the time. And so she is no different than Wolfgang Puck being on pizza, or Rachel Ray and Martha Stewart and their faces on the packages of products that they create. And it's taken some time for me to be able to help us all begin in a different place in our appreciation or understanding of this person, these women, but to leave this space with the same feeling about them. And that's my goal here today. It's my goal for the work. It is, this is a, a project of reconciliation for me. Um, and I'm going to show you um, a little bit about my passion and how I hope that uh, the authors contained in this book um, can contribute in some small way to increasing tolerance in, our, in the world as we're living in it today. I should have stood up. Um, Aunt Jemima trade, this, this image is the cover of the book, and um, it is the, it's a replica of the Aunt Jemima trademark. It was taken from the cover of one of the cookbooks in my collection. The author's uh, name is Rebecca West, and she was a chef, professionally trained, and she lived in Washington, D.C. in the 1940s. She represents a trademark that at one point was shorthand for greatness and perfection. The Aunt Jemima caricature, or trademark, basically was a stand-in for the words, if you want perfect pancakes, buy this product. But we're living in an era now where everyone from Food Network stars to executive chefs to food scholars and nutritionists and authors and entrepreneurs are all telling us what we should eat, what is perfect, what is healthy, how you should cook it, how easy it should be, that you should just order it online, and on and on and on. 
And at a time like this, it would seem natural that people who had spent so much time in the kitchen and on packages of food would be inspiring the next generation as well towards healthy living or to food careers that could provide them with economic independence, and yet they are not. After decades of accomplished cooking in elegant homes, in hospitals and catering companies, in church basements and railroad cars and oyster houses and grog shops and bakeries, and as ranch hands and bartenders and mixologists, and after creating recipes that made other people healthy and wealthy and happy and full, African American cooks were mostly forgotten by the food world until the Jemima Code. And so with this acclaimed book and related projects, I'm hoping to change that. I want them to become part of the celebrity chef world. For the past 20 years, I put on their aprons and their headscarves, and I poured through archives and put aside the sexist and the racist narrative that dominates most of Southern history when it comes to African American cooks. And I created what I'm calling a celebration of those people. What you're going to see is my version of an homage. So what is a code? What do I mean by this? This is how Merriam-Webster defines a code. And the, the dictionary goes on to say that it is a covert message coded into an intelligible form so that we recognize and interpret as a signal or to discover the underlying meaning of. As Americans, we live with all sorts of standardizing codes, dress codes, moral codes, codes of conduct, codes of law, bar codes. Recipes are codes, so are prescriptions. But when I talk about a Jemima code, I'm interrogating the ways that society has arranged words and images and synchronized them to classify the character and the life's work of our nation's black cooks into one insignificant trademark that was contrived to communicate a powerful double message. Hence what we found earlier, that we're all expressing and feeling some level of difference about these women. This whole thing started as a pursuit for me of my grandmother on the pages of Southern Food History when I was part of the food staff at the LA Times. It was there that I encountered cookbooks and a written history that didn't match anything that I remembered about the way that my grandmother nurtured our family at the table. And it left me with that question that started at the beginning of this talk. What can we learn from these women? And the answer I discovered is quite a bit. And it's a concept that I decided to call the Jemima Code because it was really hard for me to prove what I knew instinctively and felt in my heart. What I did was I collected cookbooks as a source of evidence. And then um, I tried to have those recipes from those cookbooks published. Um, Although I had a very long resume in the food world, as you heard, not one publisher, not one literary agent, no one would touch this project. And I was very frustrated and very determined, and so I took it to the internet. And I began a one-year project of posting a picture of a cook, a recipe photograph, and a cookbook, something similar to this image that we ran in the LA Times some 20 years ago. Um, and it was going to be a one-year project where I would just focus on one cook at a time, once a week. Uh, I even planned it to come out on Wednesday, which is Food Newspaper Day. And lo and behold, the University of Texas Press came to me and they said, we want to publish this book, but we have to publish this as a book. But they said, we have uh, two conditions. And I couldn't have been more thrilled. They said, first condition is you can't change the title. We want that provocative title, we're gonna stick with that. And the second was that it had to be a beautiful coffee table book to contradict the narrative that had been portrayed against these women for so, so many generations. And I could not have been happier. So how did this whole thing get started? It is true, of course, that um, African-American women did do the cooking in America. 
And so the Jemima Code to me is a 200 year old system of prejudices and double standards based on some element of truth. It originated in the handwritten journals and ledgers of slaveholding women and in their letters to families and friends. They expressed inconsistent emotional observations about the servants in their communities and essentially bloated the image of African American women until we wound up with something similar to this. These distorted representations about her knowledge, skills, and ability created character types in Southern plantation literature with names like Mammy and Jezebel and Sapphira. And those stereotypes, like the code, transmitted messages that were all open to interpretation. So despite the fact that we had, living in our midst, real, professional, beautiful, slim, black cooks, it became so easy, far too easy, for us to link African American women generally and cook specifically with the jarring portrait of the South's old black mammy. The stereotype certainly obscures any trace of African American excellence in Americans, America's written culinary history, but it does more than that. This omission casts a haze of harsh labor over the kitchen that doesn't encourage anybody to really want to go into the kitchen and cook. I'm rem I remind you to think of the, the um, cliche, slaving in the kitchen, comes out of this tradition. So while it is correct that black women did most of the cooking in early American kitchens, it is also true that they did that with grace and skill like trained professionals. They were chefs who honed their kitchen skills, many in the ways that uh, Glenn teaches uh, at Culinary Academy, the way that they do every day by observation, apprenticeship, with training that was transmitted orally. When they cooked, they expressed both art and skill. They may do, certainly but they also seasoned our lives and made our existence pleasurable, even under the most barbaric circumstances. They cooked our meals from scratch, they sewed our clothes, they salved our wounds, they nurtured our spirits, and they imparted wisdom over steaming plates of nourishment, and they did so all while maintaining jobs miraculously outside of their homes. So how is it that these are not the predominant images of African American cooks? That's just one of the questions I had the more I started to do this research. There were other questions. Why don't we celebrate their contributions to American culture the way that we venerate the imaginary Betty Crocker? Why wasn't their true legacy preserved? Will we ever be able to forget the images of ignorant, submissive, selfless, sexy, oh, oops, sorry, sassy, <laughs> asexual despots? Is it possible to replace the mostly unflattering pictures of generous waistlines built, bent over cast iron skillets that are burned into our memories? Will we ever believe that strong African women toted wood and built fires even before thinking about beating biscuit dough 500 times or mixing cakes by hand? And let alone that they left us with more than just their good formulas for great pancakes. To find the answers, I knew that I needed to break this code to set them free from advertisements like this that were intentionally designed to distort their appearance, making them look grotesque and animal-like to support the narrative that still divides us. And I'm not sure if you can see in the back, but the, uh, the one that's in color, you can actually see that the <coughs> bandana has been tied so that it looks like little uh, animal ears, and there's a texture on her skin tone so that it looks like hair. But what I did, instead of dwelling on this as so many historians and so many of us do, I changed, or as the kids call it, I flipped the script. I used the same observations that created the double message or the code to break it. And the difference for me was one of interpretation. So I want you to think, as I'm explaining to you now about what I did to, for this work, think about it like a recipe that has three parts, right? The recipe has the list of ingredients, 
there is a method and then there is an outcome. So the first thing I did was I started doing research and I gathered well-known and obscure ingredients from all kinds of sources. I consulted photographs, the writings of slaveholding women, newspapers, opinion pieces, recipes, tips, historic facts, scholarships, slave narratives, literature, poetry, lyrics, fine art, photography, and then one day it occurred to me that there might be black cookbooks that would provide the women's voices in uh, their own words. By the time I was finished, I had 375 black cookbooks, many of them rare, that date back to 1827. But then I didn't know what I was supposed to do with them. I had them spread out on the floor and I would just sit there with them and linger over them and try to integrate what I was reading as observations from white families that adored these people or from black families that had agonized over missing these people and try to reconsider all of this new scholarship, what Glenn called scholarship light, through a whole nother lens. I started mixing in my experiences as a 30-year culinary professional who understands the work of the kitchen to try and see them without a bias. Sometimes I let my thoughts marinate gently over it, and other times they just drove me crazy, like trying to make a delicate sauce over a flame without turning it into scrambled eggs. I would whip together these new truths and these old truths, and I would tell them to other people, and nobody understood what I was talking about. And I even began to speak around the country, trying to share the words of these women themselves. I tried to imagine the focus and imagination required of enslaved and illiterate free cooks who were unable to read or write as they performed multiple tasks at one time, demonstrating remarkable feats of recall and memorizing dozens of European recipes as they prepared meals in big house kitchens, food businesses, and in their own cabins. Eventually, a spirited story about American kitchens and recipes came to me and it dispelled some of these age-old myths. One of the sources of this new truth was this book, The Bluegrass Cookbook. It was originally published in 1904 and I reissued it with the University of Kentucky uh, Press to introduce the idea of competent black cooks who could spur us on, all of us, towards tolerance. It was written by Minnie C. Fox um, and it beautifully demonstrates the synergistic relationship between black and white women working together in southern kitchens at the start of the 20th century. It became the cornerstone of my work for two reasons. One, it featured more than 300 recipes and a dozen stunning camera portraits, not distortions of African-American cooks. It also acknowledged the huge contribution that these women had made to southern foodways to Southern culture, and to Southern hospitality. By the time I was finished, this picture that emerged began to stand boldly, side by side, against the Jemima caricature. And it started to cast a shadow for me of hope and grace on that make-believe. One of the things that I did was um, occupied a um, artistic space in Houston, Texas. This is Project Row Houses. Have you ever heard of it? Um, there is a gentleman who rescued um, half a dozen shotgun houses, and he turned them into art spaces. And arts, artists are invited to um, create installations that appear there for 30, 60 days, something like that. Anyway, our intention, this was my first effort to put this together as a book or as something visual. It started with art. And we painted all of the walls artistically in beautiful, vibrant colors of the South, Southern food. So we had a cornmeal wall. We have a sorghum wall. And we had a sweet potato wall. And what we did was we, despite my fears of associating these women with bigger than life, imagery, um, we blew them, digitized them and blew them up to um, eight feet and hung them from the ceiling so they were not up against the wall but that the 
guests who visited the space could interact with them. And as you did at the beginning, they could have their own experiences with these images. The fourth wall was painted in chalkboard paint. And we invited everyone who attended to do what I asked you to do internally, but to express their emotions, their gratitude, their remembrances, whatever they thought about these women. My hope was that there would be a transformation for at least the people that encountered those women of Aunt Jemima as a maligned kitchen servant into someone who was inspirational and powerful, a new symbol of culinary wisdom and authority. It all came together so naturally, and it was all based on that bluegrass cookbook. I started fusing the real words from um, formerly enslaved women, like this woman from North Carolina, into the words of the authors in the cookbooks in order to provide that alternative picture for young people. And I thought about young people even more than us for this reason. This is an illustration that appeared in the Texas A&M student newspaper in 2004. And what it said to me was that our high technology, best and the brightest, could not see behind a narrow cliche. How could they? If this is a student who's never encountered an African American woman, in the absence of a written history to defy the stereotype, this is the picture of every African American woman in that student's eye. At the time, I was a suburban mother. I understood what was happening here. This was um, published during um, standardized test time. And so the student was making the point that the black students, the black males, had not performed very well that year. But what was the most offensive part to me was the depiction of an African-American mother wielding a spatula like a weapon and portrayed in a stereotype. You know, I was really, my juices were really flowing by then. <laughs> then I, so I encountered this bibliography that was posted online by the University of Alabama. And I used that to feverishly search for the books that I discovered for the Jemima Code. Every week, I would enter a new title into my browser. And before I knew it, I had almost every book on this list. I found some of them for as little as a dollar, and others were hundreds of dollars. I wrote lots of freelance write articles in order to pay for it. I had to say that right up front the very first night when my husband was in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I did something else. There are lots of uh, books published by white authors, especially at the turn of the century and into the early 20th century, that depict uh, African American women in this mammy stereotype. And there are references to Dixieland or Aunt So and So's collection. Um, and those books have either been, um, they either serve the purpose of being a tribute to somebody, to the mammy that lived in someone's home, or in the case of these two, Emma and William McKinney, they actually give her name. So they provide attribution. So I began to also collect books of this nature where an African-American cook is um, given credit for her intellectual property. What I don't do is collect the negative, um, ugly books. Once I had the full catalog of the books, I started sharing my idea, as I said, and nobody got it until I told Edna Lewis. Edna Lewis is the grand dame of Southern cooking. And tragically, as I said to the group last night, she is well known and respected within the food community, but she's largely unknown among African Americans. She wrote to me in the middle of the night, she wanted to encourage me to look beyond the lists of ingredients and cooking instructions and to tell all of the ways as she had tried to in her books to um, dispel the myths associate, associated with our food and to disprove the thinking that um, the only things that we prepare are soul foods 
and poverty foods from um, survival. She implored me, in her words, to leave no stone unturned. And so that was it. I was ready. I started to be able to categorize the books. I was able to see the, the groupings that these books fall into. And they, be, they represent very specific either work ethic or um, categories of um, personal value. For example, there are books that reflect um, chefdom, right? We, don't, we know a lot more now about chefs like Hercules, who um, was known and respected for the fine dishes that he cooked um, as George Washington's chief cook at Mount uh, Vernon and in Philadelphia. We also have begun to know more and more about James Hemings, who was the French-trained chef known for ice cream and macaroni and cheese. Are you getting feedback? Yeah. I, was, I was even getting it. How about that? Is that better? Um, Hemings was French trained and known for his ice cream and uh, macaroni, cheese, macaroni and cheese that he served at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. But what I love the most is that this is a kitchen inventory that's in his own handwriting. So he disputes the myths that we were all unintelligent and unable to read or write. This book is from 1911. This is uh, Chef Rufus Estes, and he cooked on the Pullman Railroad. And he helps us understand something uh, called the Toten Pan, right? That in the South, when African Americans were working in homes, they were often given leftovers to take home to repurpose for their families. Um, and one of the things that Rufus helps us understand is that repurposing depends upon what the ingredients are, right? And so in the South, that might have meant that, um, yes, African Americans took home the, the pig parts and um, unwanted parts from the master's kitchen. But if you were serving on the Pullman Railroad, you might be taking home asparagus. And so these chefs and the books of this nature help us understand what it means when they give, they, they help us understand that when these uh, chefs speak about making blanc manger and other French dishes, that they came by that um, knowledge on the job. So he is known as our first African-American chef. There's also those who functioned in as entrepreneurs. As I said, I try not to buy any books that are um, disparaging in any way. And so this is a book from the 1940s, um, published by a white woman in the Carolina Low Country. But what's important about this book and why it is in my collection, it isn't in the book, in the Jemima Code. It's because we have, so again, as with the Bluegrass Cookbook, we have evidence of African Americans with Business 101 knowledge. These are people that would have understood inventory, how to market, pricing. These would be people who needed to make eye contact with their customers when they couldn't make eye contact with a white person walking down the street. And they are people like the nut seller, the fruit sellers, the pepper pot woman um, in Pennsylvania, the praliniere in New Orleans. I don't know what to do. Is it me? OK. So on to the first cookbooks. This is another representative of the with an entrepreneurial spirit. This is a record of recipes that were collected for business purposes. This was by a woman named uh, Melinda Russell. She was a free woman of color, and she published this book in 1866, and she owned a boarding house and a bakery, and she tells us this in her little introduction. She's an example also of the first woman we know working outside of her home. She had a disfigured child, and she, was, she published this book with the white women in her community in order to raise money to return home. 
She also gives us little clues about her expertise. She wants us to know that she's following the plan of the Virginia housewife. It's a way for her to give an endorsement of her um, proficiency. Someone asked me earlier about the condition of some of these books, and this book is so fragile that it's, on, uh, dis it's in the archives at the University of Michigan. And this represents a reproduction. Um, they sold facsimiles of it um, with student research, and I'm not sure that they're still available. Um, this book by Abby Fisher, she was also an entrepreneur. She had been enslaved in uh, North Carolina, and when she was set free, she and her husband Alexander moved to Northern California where they operated a pickles and preserves company, and she won all kinds of awards for that work. Last year, I posted on Facebook that I was desperately um, looking for money in order to attend an auction in New York City. A copy of this book turned up and I needed $10,000. So I posted that I was digging in my husband's pants pockets and in old purses and in seat cushions looking for anything I could find. And people said, you have got to do a GoFundMe campaign. And I said, absolutely not. I'm a journalist. Those are for serious needs. Well, I relented. And at the end of 10 days, we had raised the $10,000. That's how serious people how seriously people believe in this work. So I know that it's beyond me. Abby Fisher um, is important because of her entrepreneurial skills as well, I said that. Um, Dory Sanders is a more modern day expression of entrepreneurial traditions. Um, she wrote a book based on her peach stand in South Carolina. I'm gonna zip through the rest so we have time for questions. I wanna tell you a little bit about educators. Um, to counteract those negative images, like this one, um, of black women, they started creating their own cookbooks, as we see in more and more volume. And they started creating textbook-like collections. So this picture is from a book called Dixie Dishes. It was published in 1941. And can you tell the subtlety of this, what bugs me about it? So we, we like that, that the Jemima character looks like she's the intelligent one, right? She's the teacher. But guess what I think about that little girl? She's the housewife. So even within giving the compliment that she's the intelligent teacher, she's also caricatured as this bigger than life, threatening, I, I can't interpret it all. And there were other ways. Um, this is an example of a recipe um, that ran uh, in one of those, that appeared in one of those diaries. And I just insert this to show the um, way that the uh, women were caricatured through words. So it wasn't all about pictures, it was also done through words. You might say to me, well, that's just the vernacular of the language and that's how they spoke. Okay, what I like about it though is that when you get near the bottom when she says, um, then I mix mucks in the eggs or no eggs and I dump in the flour. Oh no, above that. She says, if they's dear, I takes two or one will do right well. And if they's very dear, I discharge eggs and don't use no eggs at all. So this was one of those early stages uh, in my research where I discovered that the holder of the information isn't the transcriber. It is the woman who is doing the cooking. She's not saying that she's too ignorant, as in previous um, depictions of them. She's saying, I understand that the way that I bake depends on the attitude of the chicken that day. They began to focus more on the scientific side of cooking. They realized that the culinary industry was blossoming at the turn of the century, and they were starting to come up with new and original dishes. And so we have culinary academies sprouting up for African Americans. The argument against this has been that, again, they were being forced into servitude, no other options. But in light of what we learn at Culinary Academy today, and the slogan in top of the classroom, cease to be a drudge, seek to be an artist, makes me very proud of them. Aren't they cute? And there are textbooks that emerge from this period. 
This one is really interesting. Um, she um, operated a private school of her own uh, in Omaha in 1925, I think. Of course, we know about George Washington Carver and all of the booklets that he created to help us understand recipes and cooking. But what we often don't think about is that there are other sides of his nutritional knowledge, and this is something he called the Jessup Wagon. It's basically um, the beginning of the USDA Extension Service, where he was helping people in the community learn about healthy cooking, one-on-one. -on -one. This is Lucille Bishop Smith. Her great-grandson was so inspired by her wonderful little treasure box, published in 1941, that he has opened a restaurant in Houston in the Museum District, and it's called Lucille's, and it's a fine dining restaurant. He's Cordon Bleu trained. There are women in the media. I love this book, this, um, the book that emerges from this collection of um, food columns in Baltimore. It was intended to be disparaging, but what's really thrilling to me is that Aunt Priscilla becomes the first black food editor. So she's my inspiration. This is, did I lose one? No. Um, this is a picture of Lena Richard in New Orleans. She had a cooking show 20 years before Julia. What's in, wonderful and curious about this at the same time is there are at least four editions of this book. It was published in 1939. The uh, blue one at the top is her self-published book. It has her name on it. And inside, there is this beautiful cameo of her. Well, James Beard discovered this book and he went to his publisher, Houghton Mifflin, and suggested that they republish it. And what occurred is the, lime, the green book on the left. Her name is no longer there. It's the New Orleans cookbook by Lena Richard. And her photograph has been removed. By the time I discovered it in 1985 in a book giveaway, it is the first book that I ever collected. Um, there's no reference to her at all as African American, no picture, no nothing in that um, little paperback. And I could go on and on and on like this. <laughs> there are professionals who represented corporations. There are books that try to explain and provide evidence for the cooking of the black middle class. There are books by authorities Everybody sees this and thinks it's really creepy the way that Farmer John is uh, <laughs> hovering over her shadows, sort of like what we're having now. We want to go back to those old days, the good old days. Um, but she's clearly the expert. Mary is the expert for the syrup company. And they all took advantage of the Aunt Jemima advertisements. Aunt Jemima had some cookbooks of her own. I love that Aunt Julia from the 50s depicts the women reading cookbooks. They do catering for economic independence. The mansion on the bottom began as Mary Ellen Pleasant's um, boarding house, but she was recorded in history before this cookbook as a voodoo priestess who killed the men that she served, and that's how she gained her wealth. This is the corner in San Francisco where that house once stood. And those eucalyptus trees are still, I took this picture two years ago. Um, those eucalyptus trees are still there. She planted those. And the building is, I, I can't remember if that's part of the building, but it's a, um, uh, a senior citizen's facility. And that um, marker acknowledges that she was there. That's better than most. This woman is from California, and what I love about her is that we can see that she was so accomplished as an entrepreneur that she's holding her furs in the photograph. This was a caterer to the stars. And Jesse Payne um, helps us understand that we are finally free. From this collection of all of these books, I'm now, without any further hesitation 
or anxiety or fear, able to go out into the world and explain that African Americans had healthy eating habits, they ate largely fruits and vegetables, they were at the center, just like all of the rest of the South, of the farm to table practices. They understood garnishing and food styling and making sure that the meals were pretty through their catering businesses. They understood food science and how to manipulate a recipe so that when the mistress of the house told them to make cornbread, if she tells her to stir it to the left, the African woman eventually decides to stir it to the right and it becomes her cornbread, especially when she adds chilies or cheese or whatever corn to make it her own. This is Edna Lewis's Blackberry Cobbler and it helps us understand the simplicity of of cooking with really high quality ingredients. That this cobbler doesn't need anything except really good fresh churned butter and a sprinkle of sugar and a larded pastry. I began this, uh, I, I took this messaging out into the world and um, Karen, uh, Andy, and I can't tell if you're in the pictures or not, but Scott is. Um, we um, held a program to teach this messaging um, two young people at UT Austin. They had their own garden and Whole Foods supported them. We invited the, Karen invited, the um, pastry chef from the White House to cook with those children. And we engaged university students in nutrition to help be their instructors. What all of this says is that each one of us in our own individual way can promote this message as a way to break down the barriers that exist between us. We can tear down stereotypes so that the next time you encounter someone on the street and you think, oh, here comes another one of those, you'll realize that there's always two sides to every story. And um, stereotypes are built one affront at a time. So if we can take them down one positive story at a time, we might actually be able to create more tolerance between each other. So thank you so much for listening. Are there any questions? I would love to entertain your questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand high. We'll be passing a mic on either side of the room. Too much information? Yes. I just want to say thank you. Oh. You're welcome. Hi. I Hi. Um, teach food studies at the University of Oklahoma, and I actually have a question from my students who read this book as part of their summer school class. Um, the students love the book, and um, they wanted me to ask you a question um, that I tried to answer, but I said I'm just gonna have to ask her when I go see her. A lot of students really loved the Jemima Code, but one of them who was very perspicacious said, you know, it must be hard when you write a book like this to still have to have it authenticated. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's like the slave narrative where you have people saying, you know, this was actually written by an African-American. They wanted to know how you felt about John Edge and Barbara Haver um, doing the introductory work. Um, I didn't know that you were a founder of the SFA, and so I think my answer to them would have been different. But um, it's really interesting to me just the way the book was brought out with an introduction and a foreword and um, legitimating sort of quotes on the back. So um, I, would, I would just like you to answer that question so I can tell them what you said, and I'd be interested in hearing it's your answer as it's well. A great, it's a great question, and it brings, us full, it brings us full circle to where I began in saying that as an African American, I felt like it would be harder for me to produce this. I was a journalist, not a scholar, and um, at that time, as Glenn said, they were, there was a lot of criticism of the work we were doing as uh, light scholar or revisionist history. Um, and so I was very concerned about um, being a black person representing a positive story that nobody else believed in or ever heard of. 
Um, John Edgerton was a mentor to me. We were very, very close. I had to drag that forward out of him right before he died. Um, he, he was adamant that he did not want his identity to overshadow this work. Um, but I literally begged. Um, and it, the second part of my answer is that I was at one of these food conferences, and a question from the floor was, when did the authors cease to need a white woman to legitimize them as their co-author or as their transcriber or as the lead to the book? And um, someone very close to me looked at me and said, are you going to say it or not? And the answer was, it hasn't stopped. Um, as a journalist, I understood reviews and reviewers and scholars and the heat that I might take for this work. And so both Barbara and John, um, who had been part of that mentorship team, agreed. Neither of them was happy about it, honestly. They, didn't, they hoped that by this time we didn't need it anymore. Um, but they both were very pleased to do it in the end. Thank them for their um, support and their appreciation for it, because it is for them. Yes? There's a mic. I'm just curious, what were some of the most creative ingredients or techniques that you saw when you were in there? Um, you know, it's hard to put the old-fashioned ingredients in today's perspective. Right? There are the earliest books speak in, in the classic language. They are measurements in gills. Um, the Melinda Russell book from 1866, I actually had to speak to a scholar to understand what do meant, D-O. And it, so Melinda would use that a lot, one do, two do. And it was essentially um, a reference back to the previous ingredient, um, but only historic scholars understood that. Um, and so there were those little nuances. Um, I was really surprised to see um, how much they embraced the work that they, the food that they created at work as their own. Um, one of the most challenging things for me to um, promote to a publisher um, was this idea that there is no African American canon that emerges from this. And I've had to explain that that's because African Americans are not immigrants. So we did not come here with a food history that we tried, with traditions that we retained. We would have been killed for that. That doesn't mean that those um, practices did not persist. So it was fascinating to see the number of what we call Africanisms that are inserted. Um, one of those is the direction of stirring, um, the use of benny seeds as a thickener or other nuts. Um, that's something that's an African practice. Um, comp composed dishes, so when you think about red beans and rice, um, Hop and John, we think those are just classic southern dishes, but in Africa they com combined a starch with a protein in order to um, be better nourished. Um, and so there are dishes like jollof rice from Senegal that become red rice in the Carolinas, then they become jambalaya in New Orleans. And so it was fascinating to see the transition of the dishes um, uh, from a people that had to try to remember um, and insert their practices quietly. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that um, the use of um, pork in collard greens as a seasoning descends directly from um, the practice of putting a little palm oil at the end of the cooking of the vegetables in Africa because it created a slick kind of a um, texture to the greens. And so there are some, some practices that were tra traditionally there. Mm -hmm. Yes? During your, during your three years of your book tour, were you able to ever reconnect um, with some of the children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of some of the authors that you yeah. were able to put into the book? And, and if so, what was their reaction and their response to your work and, and hearing those stories about their ancestors? Yeah, what a great question. Um, so the woman with the treasure chest recipe box, um, before I actually met them, when the book was still a blog online, 
um, I received a note on one of the columns. There, were, there was a space for comments. And one of her great grandsons posted that they were thinking about opening a restaurant. And they had been looking for her and research on her. And they'd been online. And then this blog popped up. And subsequently, they opened this fine dining, wonderful restaurant. And they used the cards over the fireplace in this old house as an art um, element. It's really beautiful. Um, so they were the first ones. And just um, last week, um, a woman wrote to me, and she did not have the name of the ancestor correct. She said that she was trying to find a book that her mother always talked about that was written by the mother's cousin or something like that. It was a complex story. Um, but she said that it, was, it had a number in the title, and it was three southern cooks. And she had all these details that were disjointed. And I wrote back to her and said, well, there is a book in, from Savannah called The Four Southern, Greatest Southern Cooks. And, the, you know, and she was elated. Um, she was able to go to Amazon, buy a used copy of it, and she's going to present that as a gift to her mom. Yeah, that's pretty special. So yes, people have uh, reacted. Um, I, the picture that I set with a woman with a corn cob pipe, that was the most popular photograph being sold at the Austin Public Library. They had photographs of the Stevie Ray Vaughan statue, of the Austin skyline, and then they had this mammy. And I was in there researching, and I asked them who she was, what was so particular about her, why her. And they said, we don't know. We don't know anything about her. Only All we know is that this is the, most, this is the top selling photograph that we have. So I spent some months researching her um, in the archives, um, Texas archives. I found out who owned her, uh, where she lived, where she was buried, all of that, and ran a story about it in the alternative newspaper. And I subsequently um, received in the mail a painting um, by a man who had been connected to the family that owned her. And they had the picture, that picture, they had a copy of it, and he had painted it and sent it to me. So I have not only that, just that black and white that the Austin History Center sent, but I have this beautiful portrait of her in oil. It's really nice. So there's been some wonderful. There has not been an icky moment um, on this tour. Um, everyone has received this, this um, message really well. Um, it's been emotional. I cry. The audience cries. Um, it, these people, ha embracing these people and celebrating them has allowed families that had mixed messages happening in their homes during Jim Crow and segregation to re-embrace those cooks or to forgive their parents or whatever was happening for them in the South. Um, and so I've had some really wonderful stories, um, one in particular of a person who talked about being on the threshold between the kitchen and the front room. And he would look into the kitchen and he worshiped the cook that was in there, but his family was disparaging the black people in the front room. And he could not put all that together as a youngster. And so he had to just discard the memories that he had of that woman. And through this book, he talks about the um, cathartic expo experience and the way that he was be able, able to re-engage all of them. So thanks for your question. Yes. Yes, out of all the books, which one has been your favorite? Um, Kamala Harris said the other day when she was interviewed that they're all like flowers. And how can you choose the one that you love the most? They all smell so fragrant. Um, I can tell you that I'm pretty close to Edna Lewis um, because I spent time with her before she passed away. And her books, um, there's a new book out, University of North Carolina Press has um, issued a, a um, collection of essays written by people that had a relationship with her or people, primarily people that um, were inspired by her. So a lot of the people that don't know her in this, these essays. Um, but the book is largely devoted to um, the second or th the third of her books, The Taste of Country Cooking. And it's all about, it actually helped put Southern cooking back on the map because she shows the importance of fresh herbs and 
pastured meats and living close to the soil. And, and that was what Southerners needed in the late 70s and 80s during the time when Southern food was disparaged as sweet, overly sweet, overly salty, full of fat, and so on. Um, but what I like about her first book, the Edna Lewis cookbook, is she owned a restaurant in New York City. And that book is primarily a combination of her restaurant knowledge and her farm experience. And so she illustrates, in a modern sense, what a lot of the older authors did, which is to show the dexterity of those cooks and how nimble they were. If we just think, bless you, think about um, the capacity of their memories and trying to remember all those recipes and that their performance of those recipes um, could be life or death. So I would say that the oldest book in the collection probably um, means a lot to me um, for that reason. We'll take one last question. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming. Second of all, I think what you've done is amazing. I have a two-part question. First, I wanted to find out, as a graduate from an HBCU, how can we get this information out to younger people to kind of like keep the tradition alive with the youth? Because as a graduate of HBCU, they always teach us the history, but we never learned about anything. And I think this is amazing. Especially if you notice that the university, the little culinary students, yeah, were all at HBCUs, all of yeah. them. Yeah, they glaze over it. And then my second question would be, have you thought about um, curating this in a form of a documentary, maybe, that you could like, send out to schools and universities? Yes. Um, we have, uh, I've been approached um, to put this into a documentary. So everyone says, well, what are you going to do now that you're not going to be on tour? Well, I start tour again in September, so I have 30 days. <laughs> I have 30 days to take, I'm telling you, I've got Rubbermaid tubs of just pictures, images, that I pulled down off the internet. There are all of those enslaved narratives that are just, that it just extract the food references from every southern state. Um, so it's a daunting project, but I envision a Ken Burns type documentary, and I'm not going to settle for less than that. So obviously, you have to have funding for that, and so we're, we're going to be thinking about that. Um, it might be what I decide to turn my nonprofit into. I can tell you that um, I have approached um, historically black colleges, and there's a love hate relationship. Yeah. Yeah, there's just the memory that those colleges were founded as land-grant colleges based on agricultural studies and forcing, wedging black people into only maintaining the exact same jobs that they had as enslaved in the private sector. And so there's some reluctance. They want to move on. They want to teach you to, you know, more professional careers. And so my work, the, the reason there are no recipes in this book, by the way, if you're looking for them, their recipes are the next book, um, which is called Jubilee. Um, and the reason there are no recipes is because the, com the material is so complex that just to get people to appreciate the professionalism and that they deserve a Department of Food Studies, or that there, Lucille Bishop Smith, her name should be on the building at Prairie View because she created all of the curriculum in, uh, in Texas um, for them and for the Fort Worth School District. But when I proposed that to Prairie View, they didn't even know that she had been a teacher there. So it's, there's obstacles like that that tie back to that first opening slide and the question of how are you feeling about them. And um, there's the sense that we want to forget that past, and servitude is not where we want young people to go. Um, lastly, I will say that my hope isn't that young people believe that they have only servitude as servant, uh, service as an option. When we talk about food studies, we're talking about such a wide swath of career options. We are in desk. I'm looking. The reason my next book isn't out is because I have a contractual agreement with my publisher to have an all-black creative team. We cannot find one. We need black. I'm creative. We need black. <laughs> You're so sweet. Talk to me afterwards. 
We need black food photographers. We need black food stylists. Glenn has all kinds of programming there. We need students to become architects and build restaurants and understand um, food science and get into regis becoming registered dietitians and carry nutrition back into our communities. We need people who will help understand that these foods can be turned into food trucks and be give people economic opportunity in de severely depressed neighborhoods. And the, the, the number of characteristics that emerge once we have the books in front of us that show young people this is your history. It's not exclusively what you've been reading and taught. There is another opportunity for you that enabled your ancestors, our ancestors, to move into the middle class. The second book is all about the middle class. It's about the, the progression out of the South and what happened to the grog shop owners and the oyster people and all of those vendors and people that settled black towns and what food meant in those places. Um, so as soon as I find a black food stylist, we'll be ready to go. Mm -hmm. Well, please join me in thanking Tony once more this evening. Thank you. I will be happy you to sign your, your copy book. of the Jemima Code. We'll be doing signings right here in the front of the Great Hall.